Hello and welcome back to a, another episode. Oh, sorry, there, <coughs> a bit croaky. Um, another episode of our uh, expert series on the for the property investor podcast. And today we have a very special guest, Raymond Hempstead. Welcome, Raymond. Good day, Alan. Thanks for having us on board. No worries. My pleasure. And um, yes, uh, we certainly haven't had uh, you, um, anyone else on like you and and what you provide um, to um, the property investment industry. So yes, very curious to find out more details. I did ask a few cheeky, quick questions before we hit record. Um, and um, But I have heard about Supervest, which is your business, um, mm. and um, been dying to find out more. So um, maybe just start off with yeah, your background, how you got started in the industry okay. and, and, and why, and, and yeah, we'll take it from there. All right, all right. Like- Bit of, bit of background on me. I'm a, I'm a Queanbeyan boy. Grew up out of just outside of camp. It is New South Wales, by the way. <laughs> not ACT. Yeah. Um, but I, I got into real estate in my late late teens, early twenties, and hated it. Um, uh-huh. I was selling um, new landed house packages down at um, North Line and ACT, which is a greenfield site back then. Yeah. Um, ended up getting out of it. Fairly quickly after getting my qualifications, moved to Sydney, became a trainee accountant, and for the next 16 years, um, accounting was my passion. And then I had a motorbike accident, major head injuries, couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. Um, and for two years recovered, then back into business. Um, and about seven years ago, I got back into property, which my wife laughs about because we were engaged when I quit the first time. <laughs> um, but so we started selling um, landed house packages to accountants and financial planners. Yeah. And then one of the clients we were, we were dealing with, um, we'd sold them some NDIS properties under a two-part contract. The land wasn't titled. And they came back to us at the time that land was titling. And they said, we, need to, we want to put this into a self-managed super fund. And I looked at it as like, uh, yeah. that's actually illegal. You can't do that. Um, like you can't have a two-part con- contract with debt, so you take out a loan. You can't have that in a super fund. Mm. And so though, though I lost those two deals, but what it did to me, it highlighted me to the fact that the limited choice people had in their superannuation, right? Because if you go back a, a little bit, my dad, my dad retired on the government pension because in his early fifties he lost a lot of over half of his super because of he took some incorrect advice. Right, and and he never recovered, and so I lived with that. I saw my dad um, retire on the government pension, really like double dipping tea bags to try and save money. Like it was, yeah. it was really really sad. Yeah, it's um, sad. for me to see my hero do that. And so when this all this all came together around this point in time, understanding where my dad came, my accounting background, my business background, and then losing these two deals, I'm looking and I'm thinking. How do I invest myself? And it's like I choose the builder, I choose my finance, I choose my location, I choose what I want to build, and then I'll go and build it. Yeah. And then I looked at what you could do inside a self-managed super fund, and you couldn't do any of that if you're going to use debt and leverage. No. And so yeah, that then it literally that point was the the crux and, of actually. And that's coming all up because with solution, it's considered but. to be too risky, isn't it? Oh, like it, it's actually a good it's actually a good thing the government's done in not allowing you to do two-part contracts in a super fund with debt because if the builder goes broke, you haven't got a house, you haven't got an asset, yeah. you've got yeah. 100,000 pieces of stuff. Yes. Where having it as a single-part contract or um, a, what they call a single acquirable asset, now you've actually got an asset. Um, so it's a, it's a, it is a very good protection uh, mechanism the government's put in place, but that protection along with protect, protection comes limitations and yes that limitation removes all of the high cash flow properties or positive cash flow properties away from people that are looking to have a different choice about how they're using their superannuation okay so how did you go about coming up with this solution um i, I looked at bill if prior to supervest you could actually buy new properties in your super fund 
But what it meant is you had to find a builder that was going to fund 100% of the cost. Yes. And that what that meant is you were now limited to where that builder was building and what, what they were building. And so you still didn't have choice. And unfortunately, most people, what they were buying were high-rise apartments or units or some townhouses and a very small spattering of um, like lands and house packages. But all of them were negatively geared, mm. right? Because if you think about if a builder is going to build here, the only reason they're building in that location is the best profit for them. Yes. You as the super fund are just their exit. So it might be a good deal for you, but more than likely it's not going to be because it, it's an investment for the builder. And mm. so I looked at how the builders were structuring theirs and how they were funding it, and then I stepped back and I said, okay, I've just got to find to do that and provide that solution. I've just got to find a whole lot of money um, to be able to fund the deals. And so I went out to market. Um, no one wanted to touch me. It was a new product. Yeah. <laughs> as, as an ex-mortgage broker, you can understand that. Yes, um, yes. And so I ended up at a family office down in out of Melbourne with some very expensive money. But what it did, it allowed me to kickstart some deals and get my the numbers on the line yep. and get my EBITDA figures up. And then I went back out to market um, probably around two years ago. Um, and now I've got one of the leading tier two lenders being Columbus Capital. They're okay. now providing us wholesale funding for all of our construction funding right across Australia. So right. we we physically um, we physically do the construction funding yeah. um, and allow the investors being in the self-managed super fund space, or the majority of them are, to be able to now choose what they want without having the limitation of um, finding a builder that's going to fund it. Okay, so so essentially you're you're financing the construction. Um, yeah. You're providing that that single contract to um, the super funds to be able yeah. to to buy it. Um, so yeah. in a way, you're you're buying the 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 land as well as um, doing this yeah. construction finance, but passing it through. Um, yeah, yeah it, it's um, are there issues with like stamp duty and so on with um, oh, with doing that? Yeah, like you. The way it works is the client chooses everything. We will then buy and settle on the block of land and we pay stamp duty on the land. Right? Yeah. We will then engage the builder and pay him all his construction progress payments. At the same time as me signing those contracts, we issue a single part contract to um, the self-managed super fund and they pay a 35% deposit against that single part contract. Now they, excuse me, the stamp duty is part of our holding costs. And that's just added to the, the actual single part contract price, along right. with, we've got um, our interest our interest holding costs, um, our legal fees, the mortgage fees, um, any land tax that we've got to pay on, on that project during the process. But yeah. that's all pre-calculated and you yeah. the single part contract price has that. Um, okay. And that's what the client then pays against. Right, and then um, and then the super fund would have to pay stamp duty then as well. Um, they because the self a super fund can only buy a single acquirable asset. It, it can yeah. only buy a completed property. Yeah. So when we sell it, when we actually settle on that single part contract, it will pay stamp duty on the single part contract price, yeah. just as if say it was one point two million dollars. Oh yeah, because you're, pay, you're only pay, you're only paying stamp duty on the land on the at land. that point. Yeah, That's so it's, it's it's so it's not as much of a hit. Um, no, no. So okay, that that I, okay. It's sorry, just getting my head around it. No, for no, the benefit that, of fine. everyone else, yeah. But what what it does now, it gives total choice to the investors. Now, yeah, ab- up until absolutely. now, they could only buy established. Now, they can still buy established because that's under a single part contract, or they can go out and buy new, and buy under a single part contract as well. If they're both $1.2 million, the stamp duty they're paying on the, is the same. Now, yeah. it's, now it's like, okay, which is going to give me a better return? Which is going to give me the better capital growth? Which is going to give me better depreciation? And so this is where you talk to your advisors and you, you can now compare apples with apples. Yeah. And 
actually make a true informed decision rather than what they've been able to do up until now is only go and buy established. Okay. And so now they can they can build whatever they like. All right. So if someone came to you and say, hey, I've got a block of land, I've got my builder, um, how do I, um, you know, uh, uh, this this is what I've been quoted um, yep. or these are the prices um, and um, how, how quickly do you come back with, oh, yes, so th this is how it's going to work with using SuperVest? Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, like one, one of the things I'd ask, though, is, the build contract that you're getting from a builder under a normal two-part construction usually is not turnkey. Like, and yes. what I mean, like, like turnkey as in you when, need the grass, when the property the is finished, and the, yeah. like you can literally take a set of keys from the builders and you can hand them to the tenant and yep. everything else is done. That's what I classify as turnkey. Yep. Most, most two-part construction builds don't include... Some include the letterbox, some include the driveway, some include some turf at the front, none, none at the back, some include fin like now you and just you have need to the work out. And the light fittings and all those sorts of things. Exactly, exactly. So you just want to make sure the build contract, is it a, is it a turnkey build contract? If it is, um, we then put a, we've got a calculator, we just put the land price, build price, the state and the term of the build, like how long the build is going to build take to build um, and it will give us a, a single part contract price literally within a couple of minutes fantastic yeah okay and how, how many of these have you done over the last number um, of years over 400 at the moment wow yeah, yeah. so it's, it's so it's so it's not just a, a new thing that you're you're trialing out it's no. it's been tried and tested and um it's uh, definitely out there um, yeah and when, when I came up with a solution at the start, I actually went to the ATO and I said, look, I need a private product ruling against this product that I'm that I'm developing. And they went through us and they asked questions and a couple of interviews and they came back and they said, look, we can't give you a private product ruling because there's already a public product ruling that covers exactly what you're doing. And so, yeah, two, yeah pro public product ruling 2012 slash one covers exactly what we do. So... Right. So, so at least they they gave you that confidence that you're covered. Exactly. Exactly. Because I, I've had some issues with dealing with builders in my past when I was doing accounting. They, they they got some they got some tax advice from a lawyer, and the ATO didn't agree with them, and so there were some issues. So I thought, hey, we'll just go directly to the source. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So that was good. And. Um... Um, no, that's that's really interesting. And who who, who do you mainly get? Um, how how do people normally find out about this product? Is is it through uh, you know other professions like accountants or yeah or agents so like, or um, accountants, real estate agents, um, mortgage brokers? We're doing a lot of work with mortgage brokers right now. Um, financial planners. Now, financial planners are a funny one because. Most financial planners, um, and I'm going to say over 80% of them, um, can't advise you on property, can't talk to you yes. about property. Um, yes. So there's less than 20% that will actually advise their clients if they're looking at self-managed super funds to actually look at property, mm. um, which is a shame. But we're, hey, we're out there touting it and telling people um, you, you've now got the option. You can now... You can now invest. And I suppose the great part about what we brought to market is not only the ability to build new properties, but in building new properties, you can build cash flow positive properties. So where where if you've got, say you've got 350000 between husband and wife or partners in, a, in their self-managed, in their super fund, and they've decided to set up a self-managed super fund, if they've got that in the share market, they've got $350,000 they're playing with. Mm. They can take that $350,000 now and turn that into $1.1 million worth of asset. Now, if that asset's making enough money where it's paying the loan off and putting additional funds back into your super fund on a year-to-year -year basis because of positive cash flow, you've got your normal contributions that you, you're making up to $30,000 in your super, but 
that extra cash that's coming in is just on top of that. And there's no, there's mm. no limit of how much you can do of that. Mm. So we're, like even my director of sales, he bought a property um, three and a half, four years ago, and he's literally just sold it last Friday. Um, he was His super fund grew, but he picked up $300,000 capital growth on the property in the last four years. Sold it last Friday. He's now buying. He's now taking that money and buying some um, some tick property or fractionalized properties with us, um, and then just picking up the cash flow to bolster of what's going into his super fund. Yeah, because even if that property is um, at that sort of million dollar mark versus the three hundred and fifty thousand. Even if that uh, million dollar um, value in your super fund is growing, uh, just that CPI, yeah. it's it, it's making just as much, if not more, than uh, a well performing super fund. Exactly. Where it's invested in the stock market. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that that's without taking into account any income that the property is making. Um, exactly. so, so that, that's all on top. So yeah, it, it, uh, I, I've, I've seen the financial planners who do specialize in, 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 um, property and super fund, um, mm. do these, um, do these calculations and it's really amazing. And, um, I, I suppose, uh, just, just so we don't get in trouble with, uh, ATO or ASIC, <laughs> uh, we, we need to, um, maybe. No maybe financial advice. Years. They're, they're, yeah, we're not we're not providing any financial advice here. Um, you know, uh, you know, uh, it's just general information that we're providing, and um, yeah, under your own for your own circumstances, you need to um, speak to a financial planner if you want specific financial advice. But um, yeah. Um, yeah, now that that's covered, whew, um, yeah, thank um, you for that. Yeah, now you just brought up another product um, that you talked about, which was the fractional investing. Um, yeah. Now, um, uh, this is something new that you've recently started? Yeah, this, we launched this back in end of November. Um, and this is, this is a, a fractionalised product called Tenants in Common. Now, that, that, that is a, a, a legal sales process. Mm. Um, now, some people might have heard of fractionalised investing where you can, you can buy bricks or you can buy units in a unit trust. Um, yeah. But you never actually own the underlying asset. You're owning shares again. Um, yeah, which is not a hey, it's an option. My, I've got a bias. I like property. All right. So when I when I came up with this, this was again, it was fixing a a problem that I saw in the market where people had they had leftover money that they wanted to invest in property, but investing into property with a small amount of money, you're getting you're either getting some crappy property or you're getting negative yield property. Um, yeah. And for me, without there's a couple of small exceptions. But I don't I don't promote negative gearing. I don't like losing money. Um, so what I did in what the tick property does, we're supervest are actually building high cash flow properties. And now these properties are returning um, nine percent plus in rental return, plus capital growth once they're once they're actually built and tenanted. We're actually building them, we own them, and we're then selling 35% shares or 35% of that property in 5% shares. So people can spend sixty or seventy thousand dollars and buy a five percent share in one of these properties. And because right. it's tenants in common, their name's actually on title. Right. right. So they own that five percent. So they get five percent of the income coming from that property. They get five yeah. percent of the capital growth. They also get 5% of the depreciation out of the property as well. So yeah. they get some tax benefits as well there. Um, but it's as if they own the whole property, but they just get 5% of it or 10% depending on their shareholding. So it's, okay. an amazing, it's an amazing product. And, and can they sell their 5% at any time? Yeah. yeah. Like I've got first right of refusal, but yeah. if they choose if they want to hold it, they, they can sell it. They can, they can move on. And it's a simple process. Okay. Like they can get a commercial valuation. I get a commercial value valuation. We get an average of the two, and then let's go. Right, yeah. and um, and, and of course they'd have to pay stamp duty on that five percent. Yeah. Uh, yeah, when they buy, yeah, and the new buyer would have to pay, and um, and and, and it's not, and it's only five percent of that of the 
the um of the total of what the stamp duty would be um yeah. okay interesting it's um yeah. and and um they get five percent of the of the net income um yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah so like and we've we've got we've got a lot of lot of i'm, I'm gonna say i'd have to check but it's you'd be close to helping 30 percent of the, the clients that are now buying the tick property shares a lot of them are renters themselves they they yeah. they can't they haven't got enough to get into the property market to go and buy their own property but yeah. they're actually buying five and ten percent shares and on a hundred and twenty thousand dollar ten percent shareholding they're getting some of them are getting north of eleven percent but even if they're only getting ten percent that means they're getting um twelve thousand dollars a year rental income mm. yeah and that's a that gets paid monthly so as yeah. the rent comes in 14 days after the end of the month they get their percentage of the rent great and, so, and, and yeah. how long has this been um uh, up and running for oh we launched it on the end of just well, mid mid november last year oh great okay so it's yeah. uh, a little while but not too long and, and yeah, no. what's what what's the the reaction been like um the up the uptake as people start to understand it um i think we're a, I think we're at about 40 properties at the moment that we've got. Wow. Yeah. And that that's and, and, that's just it's accelerating. Okay. And these are all high income type of properties as well. Um yeah. you mentioned. Yeah. And yeah, so they'll, um, they'll be the high in, and classify high income, they'll be NDIS properties or co-living yep. properties. Now okay. I'm I'm very specific about when I talk about NDIS. Um it, we we run what we call a participant-led model. So we work closely with the SDA providers and SIL providers that yeah. actually manage the disabled people and they tell us where they need properties. And they tell us that they've got uh, participants that have got SDA funding against their care plan and we go and build properties in those locations. And so okay. we've got tenants, we've got tenants because a lot, of, a lot of your listeners would have heard some of the crap that's going on across social media about NDIS. Yes, there's and, been a lot of concern um, about it. So. Yeah, and and a lot of that's because marketers have grabbed hold of the fact that the government's going to pay this huge amount of money. And they said, great. And they, they get a builder and they say, builder, I want to build a house in this location and we're going to make an NDIS house and we're going to say it's going you know, to have three HPS, like high physical support, Make two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, and um, let's go and market it. And by yeah. the way, let's put a whole lot of huge commissions on it as well. Of course. Um, and so then they go and market it. Unfortunately, people get duped, and they see these big figures, and they don't understand the NDIS correctly. Understanding you'll never get three HPS, or very rarely get three HPS in a place. Or one, mm. one of the ones I saw just recently. It was a four bedroom place and they said you could have four robust clients in the house. Now that would that would equal a quarter of a million dollars a year. Wow. But um if anybody's ever seen Hunger Games, <laughs> having four robust people in a house would be a bit like that. Right. Okay. That, so when you're working with prof and like just like we said about getting professional advice and financial advice when you're looking to invest, same thing when you're looking at the NDIS space. You need to be dealing with people that are professionals and have got the people in place that manage these these premises and participants already. Um, and so, is it, and can you do these anywhere? Like, is there a or is a there a best area for these NDIS properties? Um, it's it's based around the participants. And this okay. is where people get into trouble um, because they go and build, like I've had people come to us and they say, Raymond, I've got a block of land. I want to put an NDIS property on it. Yeah. Um, the block of land was sloped like that. And go figure. Yeah, or, it doesn't work. Yeah, there, there's criteria about where and where and what is a bit good block of land for these properties. Okay. But the whole the whole thing about NDIS, it's it's, assimilating the disabled participants back into the community. Yes. So, being so they, done they need to be in the community and where the community yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah, okay. exactly. 
So, so is that someone that you're you're looking to be connected with as well? Is um, NDIS providers who, um, yeah, yeah, who are, are seeking good good accommodation and and good properties? Yeah, hundred percent. And we'll, we'll we'll work together with them to be able to build properties for the participants that they manage, and that's okay. where that provides some amazing return for people in their self managed super fund. Like, I'll give you an example. Um, one of my staff, she's a BDM. Um, she bought a property off of us before she was employed by us. Right. And um, she bought an NDIS property about just under two years ago. Yeah. Um, she's net, like she joined, she joined the business 12 months ago as a BDM because she saw an ad and she said, she called and she said, hey, I want to get involved because we actually bought a property off you. She's now, she's settled on the property She's got tenants coming into the property. She's now, the valuation of the property is more than what she paid for it. Yeah. She's buying, She's building a second one right now. Fantastic. Because the, fir the first property is putting an extra $60,000 after expenses and interest back into her super fund every year. Wow, that's great. Because it was done correctly at the start. Yeah. So... There, there's some amazing options when you work with your advisors and the correct professionals about how you manage your money mm. and what you can do. And especially, like, if if you're looking at long-term holds and how you look after yourself long-term, why would you be building property outside of super in a 30 or 47% tax rate compared to inside super at a 15% tax rate? Yeah. And that, that's where people need to get financial advice. Yeah, exactly. Because it's, um, I'm, I'm sure there'll be circumstances where it is beneficial to be in personal names. Um, yeah. But, um, I mean, hey, I'd say do both. <laughs> oh, and see, that's, that's the thing. You physically can do both. And like, as a mortgage broker, you know, a self-managed super fund has its own legal borrowing capacity. Yeah. As an individual does. But see, if you're if you're hold and this this is from an accounting point of view, yep. if you're holding assets outside of super, and you're earning income out of it, and you retire, all of that income will continually be taxed. Whereas if you're holding long term assets inside super, and you retire, in most cases, there's no tax. Hmm. So you can still do both. It's it's not an either or. It's like now you can do both and build a very good portfolio across outside of super and inside super and you can do them both at the same time as you're saying that's brilliant yeah. um is there anything else we need to know raymond about super vest um we just give choice like i suppose the the limitation that we've got i suppose the change that we made in the market is one that you can now have, you can build whatever you like. The the big difference we've made is prior to us, you could have built a single part contract if you found a builder and they would have done what they call a 90-10 arrangement. You put a 10% deposit down, the builder funds everything, and at the end, you come up with a 90%. Ours is a 65-35, where you've got to have a 35% deposit of the single part contract, and it has to be against the block of land. Now, they're the only two criteria that we have in dealing with us, 35% deposit yep. and against the block of land. Everything else now is your choice and your advisor's choice. I'm not telling you you need to be in what location, what to build, how to build. It's like we're a solution to be able to make you have total choice in your super fund. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Well, Raymond, that's... Um, um, yeah, it's been great to, um, yeah, certainly a very unique um, product and an option for property investors, uh, yeah. especially with the um, ability to um, have this option in in their super fund. And, and it's really just providing choice and it making is. it easier yeah. for, for the investor and their, and their advisors to be able That's to um, to help their clients um, uh, do what they want with their super. So yeah, yeah. it was great to have you on. 
Um, Thank you very much. It's if anyone's wanting to get in touch, this is the easiest way to look up your website. Yeah, just go to supervest.com and yep. like and, that, there's and a whole that's lot of super with an A, not an E R, so S U P A Vest. Um, that's it. S U P A. And um, but of course, if anyone wants to uh, a direct introduction, please reach out to us here on the podcast um, mm -hmm. or on any of our socials, and we'll definitely put you in touch with uh, Raymond and uh, and his team, and um, and um, to be able to answer any of your questions or queries about how to get started with um, using their services and products. So, thanks again, mm -hmm. Raymond. And, I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for um, coming on to the podcast for The Property Investor. Thanks, Alan. Appreciate your time.